Hello, this is Professor Brothers, and I'm going to go over a presentation for requirements decomposition for EC 3872. So, if we look at the V process that was de defined in the last lecture, this presentation is going to look at the first couple of stages at the top left of the process stakeholder requirements definition and requirements analysis. So what we want to do is look at this, the customer discovery and needs analysis. What need would the product fulfill? And again, this was presented in the previous lecture, but I want to go back over it a little bit for this one. Is it going to be driven by market forces, social needs, artistic needs? Who are the stakeholders? So let's take, for instance, the design project in the class. Who are the cust who's the customer and what needs is this product going to fulfill? Well, I'm going to be your customer and your boss for this application. And so one of the big things about this design is that we are focusing it and saying not only does it need to operate, does it need to work, but it also has to be artistically pleasing. We need to have something that you look at and it makes you happy. And so this is oftentimes the case in um, engineering where art and engineering are kind of on that same path. And so keep that in mind as you're designing your sculptures, as you're designing um, this semester, uh, you might be doing the robot orchestra, you might be doing the sun following, following flower. Both of these are supposed to combine the aspects of art and engineering into one product. So don't have the art be an afterthought. Okay, so for the requirements analysis that you're going to need to do for this project, what you need to do, you need to look at the unique requirements. So I'm not worried about the size. Everybody is going to be the same size. I'm not worried about, you know, those generic requirements that everybody's going to fulfill. What I want to know is how are you going to fulfill specifics? Requirements analysis. Identify the need from the stakeholder. Oftentimes the customer, the customer themselves, does not know what they need. It's our job to interpret the needs of the customer and determine how to actually build the machine. So here's uh, the tire swing example. And this goes back a long way in engineering. So what the customer wanted was a tire swing. And what's proposed by the project sponsor, you know, you have this crazy thing. And then as specified by the project request, it's a three rope swing as designed by the senior architect, as produced by the engineers as installed by the, at the user site and what the customer wanted. Figuring out what the customer wants and forming those into requirements is one of the most important parts of engineering. Because if you get the requirements wrong, if you misinterpret what the customer wants, the rest of the design, the rest of the build, it, it's all for naught because you haven't built what the customer needs. Not so easy. So it, many of you might know office space. I take the specifications from the customers and bring them to the engineers. It's actually a really, really, really hard job to do. And, and dealing with customers, oftentimes who are not technical in any form, and trying to understand what they want and then interpreting that and specifying it in the form of testable requirements for the engineer is hard. Okay, so requirement decomposition must be traceable. So what we're going to do, we're going to start with a customer need. The customer is going to say something like, I want it to plug into a standard 120 volt wall outlet. And you say, okay, so that's the customer need. You start with that and you need to keep track of that. And so then you're going to derive requirements from that customer need, you're going to derive requirements, but they must be very specific and they must be testable. So for instance, what is the voltage coming out of a standard wall outlet? Let's say it's 120 volts. Well, you need to figure out for your system 
how much power it's going to draw. Is it going to be an AC or DC system? Or are you going to have the converter inside the box? Is it going to be a wall converter? Is it going to be a subsystem that converts from the AC to DC? Where's the power switch? Is it in a different subsystem? All these questions need to be addressed in the requirement scope. So for example, if somebody says, I want it to be a standard 120 volt wall outlet, what you need to do is say, okay, for our system, we're going to bring in 120, but it's going to convert it to 5 volt DC. And then you might make another requirement and say the system as a whole will not pull more than 65 watts. And you will tie those both back to the same customer need. Does that make sense? System requirements map to subsystem requirements. So then after you say, okay, our system's going to run 5 volts, who's going to produce that 5 volt? You're going to take your system and you're going to draw little boxes around different areas of the system and you're going to start to categorize them. We're going to do three levels in our hierarchy. You're going to have a level for the system at the top. And that's a box around our entire design. So, for instance, we have this device from last semester that some of the students created. And this is a wonderful example design. And so here's their box. And let's call this the system. So this is the entire system. And on your architectural, your hierarchical design, you're going to take this and now break it apart into different components. So maybe we're going to call the base of this one subsystem. And this is where the power comes in, right here. And that's where the power gets converted from AC to DC. Or maybe, depending on how you want it, maybe we have a wall brick and you call that a different subsystem. Or maybe it's part of the subsystem, but it's just over there. However you want to define it, but you need to define the structure of your system in a hierarchical manner. So maybe this bottom system and the power brick combined together, we're going to call our power subsystem, or maybe the input subsystem. That's okay. You just need to define it. You need to put it in a scope. All right. Now, after that, subsystem requirements map to components. So let's say that we said the bottom of this guy, this little box at the bottom, this is going to be one system, uh, one subsystem, excuse me. That subsystem includes the power brick, and it's going to include whatever else is inside here. Well, we can look inside here, and we can see that there are a couple of things inside here. These are a couple of different parts of that subsystem, different components. So there's going to be this component is going to get called out in our hierarchy, and this circuit card is going to get called out in our hierarchy. So your hierarchy should map to hardware. And at the very bottom level, the component level, you should be able to give that to one engineer, and they build that component. Okay, that's what we're going for. We're trying to take this design and we're trying to break it apart in smaller and smaller parts. And there, there's another component right here. I, I didn't even notice it when I opened it up. So we're going to call this speaker a component. We're going to call this PCB a component. We're going to call this PCB a component. We're going to call the power brick a component. And we group all those together into the power subsystem or whatever subsystem we're calling it. So don't start by trying to figure out all the components. And a lot of people do this, and it's, it's the wrong way to do it. Don't start by saying, okay, let's pick the processor. And then once we pick the processor, we'll figure out all this other stuff. No, start at the very top level. Start with requirements, and then make very general grouping of components. And say, okay, this grouping, this subsystem, is going to include a lot of stuff. And we don't know what that stuff is, and that's fine. Put it together into a notional box. Okay, so you start with requirements. You break, you start with a system level requirement. You break those into subsystem level requirements, and they're going to be a bunch of different subsystems. And then inside that, there's component level requirements, and there's going to be a whole bunch of components. For this project, I'm only worried about your system level requirements. But no, in a normal engineering environment, you take the system level, break them into subsystem, break them into components. Those components go to the individual engineer or the component level requirements go to the engine engineer and they build the component based on the component level requirements. Requirements must be testable. The ways you can test analysis, 
you can do mathematical analysis and say, yes, this will pass that requirement. Uh, theoretically, it will. Inspection. You look at it. One of the requirements from last semester and this semester is that it doesn't have any sharp edges. Okay, we can look at this. I can run my hands over it. I can inspect this and say, there are no sharp edges. It's good. Uh, demonstration. The subsystem system component is operated to show compliance. So we would actually turn this on, and if it was, oh, it's going to have LEDs that blink. We turn it on and say, do the LEDs blink? That's show, demonstrating compliance. And then the final way, we can test a requirement. And in order to test, we actually have to do some type of a measurement. And so there has to be a threshold. There has to be a measurement, and we have to show that the measured value is within the threshold. So, for instance, the frequency produced on this machine must be within one hertz of the desired frequency. We need to measure the output frequency and compare it to that threshold. So, remember these. You'll see them again. Requirements must be testable. They can be tested by analysis, inspection, demonstration, or test. So here, again, is an illustration of what I'm talking about. You take the customer needs. This is going to be a list. You're going to write a list of customer needs. You do needs analysis, and you come out with system-level requirements. You're going to come out with a requirement for this box as a whole, for this robot as a whole. So it might be the power delivered to this whole thing. But then you're going to break it into subsystems. So maybe the components that are inside this base need so much of that power. And so you, they get a subsystem level requirement that says the base components can draw a max of 10 watts. Inside the head is the processor. Maybe it gets 5 watts. Each arm, there's LEDs, there are controls in these arms, servos. They might each get 5 watts. Those are subsystem level requirements. And then you break that down further into component requirements and say, okay, inside the head, we're going to have the processor, we're going to have the, the LEDs that light, they each get so much power. Again, for the project, you don't have to worry about the subsystem and the component level requirements decomposition for the project. I just want you to do the system level requirements. Okay, here is a better illustration of how it works. We're going to have two pieces that work together. We're going to have our block diagram. So on the left hand side is my example block diagram. That's the system. That's the whole robot. Then inside that we're going to have subsystems. They are represented by these boxes. So we have the blue subsystem which is user input subsystem. The greenish subsystem which is the processing subsystem and the, the power which is purple in this illustration. So we start off with system level requirements that are derived and traceable back to the customer needs. There can be multiple requirements for a single customer need. There can be requirements actually that don't trace the customer needs because maybe the customer didn't even think about things that we as engineers will think about. So there are some they don't all have to trace to customer requirements but you need to identify why they're in there, okay? So there might be a need. Maybe it's an environmental need. You know, maybe it's an FCC need that says, the customer never stated this, but the FCC says that you will not um, uh, put radiation into the air above a certain decibel level. You know, so you can trace it to that. Then we break those down and apply them to each one of the subsystems. And maybe all, only two out of the system requirements to apply to that specific subsystem. Maybe there are actually a lot more than two. So maybe these requirements actually make more requirements when they get pushed down to the subsystem level because they're going to apply in different ways to that particular subsystem. And then for each component, that's inside that subsystem, there are going to be requirements that are broken down for those components. In this same manner, this block diagram would have the system, subsystem, and inside each one of these boxes, you're going to have more boxes for, say, the processor and the processor I.O. Maybe you have a breakout board. The breakout board could be a separate component from the processor, and they're going to mate together. 
Okay, does that make sense? So there's three levels to our hierarchy. System, subsystem, component. Only three. Don't make 27 levels of a hierarchy. There's three levels. System, subsystem, component. That's it. You need to specify everything in those three levels. Here is the example that I was talking about earlier with the power system. Powered by a standard 120 volt AC power. That's the customer need. The requirements that we derive from that need. And this is how I'd like you to organize it. This is the example of what I want you to do. Make a Excel table like this. This is what you need to do. Requirement number. Number them. Show where they come from. And then the actual requirement test. System will use a standard 120 volt plug. Inspection. There are four ways that we can do verification um, of a requirement. Analysis, inspection, demonstration, test. So system will contain an AC, AC to DC converter to provide 5 volts DC to the subsystems. That, I'm putting it as a demonstration. That could be inspection, too. You could just walk up and read. If you're buying this, you could read the nameplate on the AC to DC. So that could have been an inspection. I'm calling it out as a demonstration, so maybe that implies that we're making our own AC to DC converter. I don't know. Think about it. Those things matter. Think about the easiest way to test something. Then the system will not consume more than 60 watts. I labeled that as a test. So that implies we're actually going to measure we're not going to do analysis. We're going to measure the wattage consumed by each one of these subsystems and make sure that it does not exceed 60 watts. All right. Usually, um, something like that where it's a 60 watt, a lot of times that'll be an analysis requirement because you're just going to sum all the individual maximum wattages and then apply a little bit of an overage for uh, extreme circumstances. So now we can take these requirements that are at the system level in the top table. The bottom table is showing how you can break them apart into a subsystem type structure where we're applying this to the subsystem of the processor and we say the processor will run off 5 volts DC. We're going to call that as a test and again the processor will not consume more than 10 watts. That's another test. So I put them together so we can just measure it and see the wattage. At the same time, we're measuring the wattage. We can look at the voltage, just make sure it runs easy. So use the requirements document to make it clear the expectations of each subsystem. Each member of your group should get their own subsystem to design and build. They should, you should put a person in charge of each subsystem. This is one of the ways where you are going to ensure that your group is working well together. You are going to communicate effectively through these means of written documentation. So I'm going to say, hey, John, you're going to be in charge of this subsystem. Here are your requirements. That doesn't mean John has to build the entire thing. He can ask for help. He can, you know, use the resources of the group. But he's going to be in charge of making sure that task is completed. Requirements for the project need to only specify what is unique about your project. Example, you don't need to specify the size of the, the containment area. That's going to be the same for all projects. So only do things that are unique. So here are some example questions that you can ask. This is not an inclusive list. This isn't everything, but this is to get you started. Ask these questions about your project. How will your project move? It needs to have two degrees of motion. Um, and so think about that. How do you want it to move? For instance, you could make a robot that's playing a trumpet. Now, when I say playing, I don't actually expect music to come out of the trumpet when, from the musical orchestra. What I want to do maybe, though, is he moves side to side, and then he can slide the trumpet slider in and out. Okay, so that's a couple of movements in order to do the two movements, side to side movement, and then you could have a solenoid that slides the slider in and out. Okay? that would meet the requirements and you would write your requirements specific to that say we will have one movement in rotating the body we will have one movement sliding in and out a trombone slider those are your requirements very specific as applied to your project how will you power your project 
you're going to do AC, you're going to do DC, 5 volts, 12 volts. Do you have motors in your design that need 12 volts? Does your, everybody's using the Arduino Uno, that's a 5 volt system. So do you have any other voltages? Are you going to do some analog processing that you need a plus or minus 12 volts? Those type of questions. How will you interact with your project? You need to turn your project on. It might be good to have something on your project where you can manually adjust the tempo. Um, so what types of interfaces are there going to be? Um, last year, here's the project front, front panel for this one. You know, they have a nice power switch. That's required. You've got to have a power switch. You, they had a selector switch. There, here's the um, volume adjustment. And then they had a go button. They have one button that just says action button. And I, I like that. There's, there's other ones. Let me grab this other project real quick and show you this other project because they had a different user interface and it's really, really wonderful. Um, so this project, they have sliders. And so each one of these, you can slide up and down and that controls the pitch of the note and the tempo. One of these is a tempo, I think. Um, and then record, play, live, reset, and then they have two. Oh, yeah, here's the tempo. It's a, a pot, potentiometer to adjust the tempo, potentiometer to adjust the volume. And there are two degrees of movement are these dials that rotate around. Okay, how are you going to interface with the user? What types of controls are you going to have? Okay, so think about that. Oh, these guys had their power switch was on the back of their project. So they have kind of this one PCB that holds all their user interface, except for the power switch on the back. That makes great sense because the way they structured their design. So in the um, hierarchical breakdown, in their case, it would not make sense to put that power switch inside a user interface subsystem. So think about what makes sense when you're doing your hierarchical breakdown. Okay, um, what processing will be done in the software? How much do you want in the software? How much do you want to put in hardware? Because oftentimes, especially with this one, I'll give you a hint, an envelope detector might be real easy to do in hardware. Given the capabilities of the Arduino Uno, it might be a lot harder to do in the Uno, and it also will change the sampling requirements for the analog to digital converter if you do that processing in analog. What will be done in hardware? You need to have at least one analog control. Many of the projects last semester had it come in as a volume control. That's it, thank you for paying attention and uh, hopefully this helps to clarify some of the requirements. If you have questions, please um, put them up on Piazza or send me an email on it. Thanks, have a good one.